Have you ever looked into a brownie box camera and seen the lens travel across in a fifteenth of a second? You'll be able to perceive everything that is perceivable in the picture in that fifteenth of a second. Now let's take it at a thirtieth of a second. And let's perceive everything at a thirtieth of a second. And now we're up to a sixtieth of a second, and that's the first admissible point for absolute reliable reading. A sixtieth of a second, we get everybody in so they can see it, and then we move them on up to a seventy-fifth or some such thing, and then speed it up until we eventually get up to 120th of a second. In other words, if there's anything on the picture at all, the person's eye and viewingness and alertness on the thing can be trained up to see at 125th of a second if it is there or if it isn't there. What I'm giving you, actually, is naval recognition training, World War II. There were a lot of these ideas kicking around, California and other places. And the Navy and the Army got up into certain problems they couldn't immediately solve. So they picked up educators here and there, and they finally developed things like this uh, recognition training. I went a little bit further with it. We had outfits one kind or another. You can teach kids the alphabet. You can teach people that the can't read. And uh, you can teach them to read very rapidly. You can teach your little kids to arithmetic with great speed, as well as to recognize what kind of an airplane it is, given the briefest glimpse of it. All of these things, that was the intention with which the stuff was used. They brought it up into reading now. Now it's in reading, and they have, they issue you books <coughs> in the United States now that have timed uh, slides on the side of them. They, they, you set this thing. And you've got to be able to see a single word or see a group of words, and they give you different shutter speeds with which you can perceive these, and it's speed reading. And uh, as an attesting to it, actually, a, a United States senator was able to read, he had trained himself up to re read, I think it was Oliver Twist in 15 minutes or something like that. At least he was standing there, but because he's a United States senator, I don't believe that. You, you wouldn't be there. <laughs> anyway, the fellow had actually condensed his uh, recognition line. That's, that's the use that's being put to today. So they're still using this principle that came off of aircraft recognition. I never used it myself. Uh, I trained men on it and that sort of thing. I had an entirely different attitude toward aircraft recognition. I was in South Pacific at the beginning of the war. The ex extant philosophy at the beginning of the war was if it flies, you shoot it down because there are none of ours up there any place. And you sort of got into that habit. I got into a nasty habit with regard to aircraft. It's, it's a fly shoot him, you know. And uh, in fact, it's a good sport. You shoot it, you shoot at him. It's different. Sir. And uh, I was never under the delusion that the Army Air Forces were on our side. I never was. I never made that mistake. Uh, <laughs> they used to, we used to talk it over occasionally. And uh, we always came to the same opinion that we were not fighting the same war. Uh, anyway, uh, they had an IFF, Identification Friend and Foe Radar, and your radar screen would hit the aircraft, and if it was equipped with IFF, or if the IFF was working, uh, it flashed back a signal and it told you there was a friend. You just shot at everything else, so I never used this system. But, <laughs> but I did train a lot of, of people up in it and uh, used it in, in various ways and had myself been trained uh, on the system itself, and I know it's quite remarkable. The first time I ever saw, I think it was a, a Japanese bomber, slide of a Japanese bomber at 125th of a second. Let me tell you, I didn't even think there was a blackboard there that the thing was shining on. 125th of a second, you know. And I sort of saw it wink. I wasn't, wasn't even prepared, you know, to, to greet this thing at all. Uh, I didn't even know what was going to happen, you know. And... Uh, Blink. And uh, I was in there with a bunch of advanced students. The instructor says to the students, uh, what is it? And they say, uh, Mitsubishi, umps, 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 uh, something or other, uh, bomber, you know. I just looked out the window. I didn't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> I finally dug what they were up to. And I saw a group of... Uh, of uh, sailors passed from a second of scratching their heads to find out whether it was an airplane or a fly or what was that had been flashed on the screen during that second. 
to being able to hit it on the button in a 75th of a second with the greatest of ease. Just that training uh, gives you a method by which you can bring a person to observe stillness or motion in the tolerable instant of time. And we're not now talking about rigging up anything very fancy. This isn't a very fancy rig. This is any old projection machine fitted with a camera shutter that will take speeds of time and one second and down to 125th, so it's not even a good camera shutter. Most of them will take you down to a 500th and a lot of them to a 1,000th, you see. You don't need it that fancy, but it has to be a fairly big shutter, and it has to be installed in such a way that it doesn't interrupt putting in slides. If you were just to take some pictures, pictures of pretty girls, uh, anything, or pictures of handsome and strong uh, men, anything, and, and it would flick these on with some distinguishing feature. Or if you were just to take numbers written on a piece of paper, see, that were, went into the slide, just so it projected clearly on the screen. And you did this same drill, uh, just shortening the length of time necessary to perceive it. Of course, it's best to have a large assortment of drills that goes in one after the other, because people are very quickly will learn rotation. And uh, they fool you in various ways so that you throw in these slides variably, you think. Anything that they could recognize, it wouldn't matter what it was, a series of numbers, it, anything. Blondes and brunettes, it doesn't matter what it was, as long as it was there to be recognized, and you could tell whether or not the fellow had seen it. You could gradually work up his ability to perceive in briefer and briefer intervals of time, until, of course, he could perceive in the three intervals, one sixtieth of a second each, necessary to tell him if that meter was acceptably still. Now, uh, you'd have it. That would give you perfect meter reading. Now, this is uh, an interesting approach, uh, an approach through a lot of training methods, uh, visual training aids and that sort of thing, which were uh, developed a long time ago, but which were very successful. It gives you more than this. You could get into a situation here where you fit this thing up with an e-meter element and you actually see a still needle, and you actually see a moving needle. And seeing a moving needle for 125th of a second would be asking the person to perceive moments of time consisting of a 375th of a second. To perceive that it was still, it would have to be a 375th of a second that the person could perceive <coughs> an instant and to see that it was moving, he'd have to be able to perceive a 250th of a second instant. That's far beyond the tolerance absolutely necessary for a person to read an e-meter. But if you're going to train people, train them good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, anybody could make this kind of a rig and experiment around with it until he found out how to shorten people's necessary period of observation.